everybody, it's Chris Kandai here, and welcome to another episode of FAQ, Faith and Quarantine. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, this is a little series that we've been doing, trying to draw on some of the key stories in the Bible that might help us through this unprecedented, I know, I've heard the word unprecedented an unprecedented amount of times, this unusual moment in our history. And we're drawing on these ancient stories that have sustained Christians and believers around the world for uh, many, many years, thousands of years. And millions of people right now draw help and hope and inspiration from these pages. And I'd love to know uh, where you are and who's watching. Uh, yesterday we had someone join us from Beverly Hills, California. So uh, just leave me a little comment. Tell me uh, where you're watching and uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit of interaction as we go through. I'm really open to questions. But stick with me for the next 20 minutes or so where we're going to be exploring the question of how to hold, how to find faith in difficult times and how to hold on to it when things get better. I don't know what kind of day you've had. Uh, most of the people I know in the UK and in Europe and in America are in lockdown right now. Uh, they can't go out as they'd like to. And so we're finding new ways to kind of entertain ourselves or to educate our kids or to carry on our work from home. And in the UK, many of us have been watching this TV show, well, a, a YouTuber uh, called, um, uh, what's his name, Joe Wick. And so we were doing all the exercises with the kids this morning, keeping our morale high, getting our uh, hearts pumping. And uh, weirdly, I managed to put my back out, not in a terrible way, just in a tiny, tiny little way. So that's bizarre. Trying to keep healthy ended up getting less healthy. But anyway, I hope you've had a better day uh, than me. Now, this situation, it is difficult and many of us are locked in and that kind of small lack of freedom that we've we're experiencing right now it is doing something to us um, but I've been thinking about people around the world uh, who this our kind of lack of freedom would actually be a privilege to them they the kind of freedom that we still have from the comfort of our own homes is more than they've been enjoying for many years whether that's because they're living in extreme poverty uh, whether they're slaves there are still slaves living in our world today uh, or whether it's someone who's living in a place like Syria where it's impossible to go outside and people are starving to death uh, because supplies can't get to them. And so these Bible passages are not just good for us in our context if you're watching in the West, but they're universally powerful stories and I hope they can help you. Now we've been doing a little mini-series on the life of Moses and we looked at Moses who ran into the desert because he was trying to get away from people that were uh, going to track him down for murdering a slave master and uh, yesterday we looked at the loneliness of leadership and if you've missed any of these just have a look on my youtube channel or um, just scroll down on chrisk.com on facebook and you should be able to see some of the videos previously posted so yesterday uh, moses was struggling with the loneliness of leadership and um, he asks and begs for the presence of God to keep him going. We need to be spiritually sustained in these days. And the final episode we're going to look at from Moses picks up the story at the end of Moses' life. So, so maybe you know, maybe you've seen Prince of Egypt, maybe you've read some of the Bible where uh, Moses leads the people of Israel out of captivity in Egypt through the desert, um, through the, the, um, the Red Sea and, and killing all the Egyptian armies. And uh, God provides for his people, but they are 40 years in the desert because they were grumbling and, and unwilling to kind of listen to God. And at the end of the journey, 40 years, four decades later, all of that generation who rebelled against God and didn't trust him at the beginning of the Exodus have basically died out, except maybe Moses and a few kind of choicely chosen leaders. And they're at the brink of entering the promised land. And that's when you get the story or kind of the last will and testament of Moses and uh, most of it is written into this book called Deuteronomy and if you're good at your, um, your Latin you'll know that that stands for second law deutero uh, nomos and uh, this is the kind of repetition of the laws that Moses received from God on top of Mount Sinai I remember with the, um, the two tablets with the Ten Commandments on and all the other laws that came with it this is the kind of reiteration of that just before they enter the promised land. So it's a real critical juncture in the life of the people of Israel. And the people of Israel have been living in a weird form of isolation. And uh, they're about to kind of engage with other societies. And God wants to remind them of some important principles. So I'm going to pick it up from chapter 8, verse 1 of Deuteronomy. 
And God says this, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So Moses is telling the people of Israel that they need to hold on to the, the promises that God gave Abraham. God promised Abraham that he would have a land of his own. And it's only kind of now that that is kind of coming to fruition, that the people of Israel are going to enter the promised land, you know, hundreds of years later. And so we might have a kind of funny view that God doesn't care uh, or God doesn't keep his promises. But we're hearing here that sometimes God's time scale is just a little bit different to our own. And that can be true when we're facing crisis and disaster. Sometimes it's really hard for us to see the bigger gameplay of what God is doing. I sometimes think of our lives as a little bit like a caterpillar crawling up uh, an IMAX cinema screen. You know, those three story high cinema screens that will be great to watch, you know, the next Star Wars movie if there's going to be one on. And if you are a caterpillar inching your way up the IMAX screen, uh, you could probably make out that there are different lights and um, shades and colours, but you have no idea of the picture that's been thrown onto that screen because you're just too up close and personal with it and so what we have through the bible is a kind of a pullback shot we get to see the big picture of what god is doing and here in deuteronomy uh, god's saying look i haven't given up on the promise i made to your great 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 grandfathers i'm still the same god i'm still reliable you need to hold on to me and trust that god who sits both in time and outside of time at the same time uh, is able to see the beginning from the end and he is working his purposes through and sometimes we need to know that in the middle of a crisis when all we can see is the kind of minute by minute second by second news feed that God really is in charge of the bigger picture so yeah that, that that's one thing that I'm drawing out of this passage but I think the other thing to see here is that God says that I, I let you go through this difficult experience in the desert to find out who you really were to find out what you're really made of and there's a quote that's been buzzing around my head since the lockdown has kind of begun and it says this a crisis does not change people it reveals them in other words we kind of find out who we really are when we're under pressure and sometimes that can be really tough sometimes we don't like the people we find ourselves to be I know that's true about me. Sometimes I'm short-tempered or insensitive, and or I'm, I'm not. Um, you know, I just don't do things well. And when you're in lockdown, in the pressure cooker of of life, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who live in my house with foster parents or adoptive parents, and um, you know, sometimes that can mean that the worst bits of me come out, the bits that I've been kind of hiding or suppressing, and sometimes we don't like the people we find ourselves to be. And what's amazing about God is that he says, well, I know exactly who you are. I know that the secret things of your heart. I know your history and your background, but I'm still faithful to you. Um, and in one sense, the people of Israel going through the desert revealed who they really were. But it also revealed to them that they really needed God. There was no way for them to farm. They couldn't collect enough food when they left Egypt to, to kind of uh, bunker down for 40 years. They had to rely daily on the provision of God for, for water and bread. And, and maybe in this lockdown, you're experiencing a new awareness of your dependency on God. And, and the strange thing about God is that he's willing to take us under those circumstances. That we might have been ignoring him when the going was good, when life was great, we didn't think we needed God. We weren't really spiritually open. We were busy. We were filling our lives with all sorts of stuff. But but God is willing to receive us even when we have nowhere else to go. Um, I was thinking about this earlier. Uh, you know, they often say that um, necessity is the mother of invention. I think necessity can sometimes be the mother of faith. But God is still a father 
to the prodigals. Maybe you remember the, the story that Jesus told of the prodigal son. Um, a boy who didn't really want anything to do with his dad um, and uh, when, when he thought he was well off and his dad was a, a well off landowner and uh, this son decides he's going to ask for everything that he would get when his father died and his father willingly gives it to him you know I don't know if he has to liquidate some property and you know to get turn some assets into some cash uh, to be able to give his son his share of the inheritance and it must have been absolutely galling of the father to hear his son saying look I don't care if you're really alive or dead I just want the money that's mine when you do die what a horrible proposition but the father still gives the boy the money and uh, the boy zooms off as quick as he can takes all his possessions with him and goes to a foreign land and spends all his money on riotous living as the um, uh, the new testament says and then he runs out of money and he ends up down on his luck and a little jewish boy he's even stooped to the level where he's feeding pigs and willing to eat the pig food that's about as low as you could get for a jewish boy and then it says he comes to his senses and he realizes that even slaves in his father's household were better off than he was and so he starts to make his way home towards his father and it says his father spotted him from a long way off maybe his father had been at the window just longing for him to come back and spots him from a way off and I don't know you know if, if it was me and my son had treated me like this and you know I have, I have three sons at the moment uh, you know two through birth and one through fostering and love them all the same but if one of my sons treated me like this I can imagine I would be like an angry dad stood there in my house with my arms folded watching my boy come up the road wait until he knocked on the door and then waiting for him to beg and tell me how sorry he was before I might even consider opening the door that's how mean-spirited I think I might be I hope I wouldn't be but I imagine I might be but this father's really different this father spots his boy a long way off and even though he might have brought his family public shame because it would have been the talk of the town that the, where's the boy gone what do you mean he's spending all his money on riotous what do you mean he's feeding pigs you know you can imagine how gossip travels in a small town anyway the father spots the son from a long way off and he runs to him and embraces him and that embrace was a costly embrace because this son might well have been covered in pig mess and again for a Jewish landowner to run down the road and to embrace a wayward son and for a ceremonially unclean son that was really costly and yet this is the kind of love that we're told that God the Father has for all of us that if the only time we come to him is when we've got nowhere else to run to God will still receive us that's that's amazing isn't it? that's that's beautiful that's called grace there's an amazing book uh, written about the story. The story is called The Prodigal Son. It's in Luke chapter 15 if you want to look it up. But uh, it was written by a guy called Miroslav Volf. And it talks about exclusion and embrace. And, and here's a theologian that was wrestling with these stories um, after there'd been a civil war uh, between Serbia and Croatia. And uh, he'd seen what happens when, when countries rip each other apart, when communities murder each other. And yet he still found power in that story of the prodigal son to find reconciliation and healing. And so this story of a God who says, look, I'm not so proud that I'll only let you come to me um, when, when you're doing all right. You know, when you're not just coming to me out of desperation, God says, I'm still willing to receive you. And I find that beautiful. And God's saying that to Israel. You know, you trusted me in the desert. You trusted me when you had... Uh, had to when you had no other means of escaping from oppression or feeding yourselves you trusted me then and I was still your God and then God says to his people do you know what you you um, you found me in the desert you trusted me in the desert but will that faith last and maybe you're someone that because of this crisis you're you're talking to God more uh, you're spiritually open you're watching videos like this well I want you to hear that God is willing to receive you home he is willing to embrace you and say you're my child you're precious in my sight my son Jesus died on the cross that you could be welcomed into the family and embraced and you belong to me now that all of that is yours but the big question is will this faith last when things get better how do, how do you how do you know what can you do now to make sure that your faith is kind of resilient and anti-fragile and bulletproof and all those things and, and God says to uh, his people well 
actually there's a there's a there's a way you can you can be helped with that. Look what he says in uh, Deuteronomy 8 verse 10 further down the page. He says this: When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Sometimes it can feel it's easier to believe in God in poverty than it is in prosperity. And that that's where God seems to be going uh, with this incredible story in Deuteronomy. And it, it reminds me of a uh, passage in the Proverbs. That's uh, so a little bit later in the Bible. Uh, hopefully the lock in doesn't last long enough that we'll get there in these nightly videos. But you never know, so I'm, I'm saving it. But I'll give you a little sneak peek of one of my favourite Proverbs. It's a, it's actually a prayer that someone prays to God. And it's from Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 to 9. And it goes like this. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonour the name of my God. What a really interesting approach to wealth and prosperity and security. Here, uh, the, the, the guy that's writing these proverbs and there might be multiple authors throughout the book of Proverbs, long, long stories, we'll look at it at some point. He, he's, he's so concerned about his relationship with God that he wants it to affect his income and his wealth. He's saying, I can understand that if I have too much wealth, that would actually be bad for my soul. And therefore, God, don't give me too much. That's a really countercultural prayer in a world that says you can never have too much. And, uh, you know, we've seen that with the hoarders and, the, you know, the people that think their riches are going to secure everything in their lives. But this guy is saying, well, you know what, I'd rather not have more than I need because I'm scared, scared it will actually destroy my soul. And I've met incredibly generous people who have made huge amounts of money, um, but don't want that money to hurt them. And so they've given it. My little charity, Home for Good, it's a charity trying to find foster carers and adoptive parents for children in the care system. It's under our care system in the UK and around the world. I know this is going to be true. It's a huge pressure right now as more kids uh, are going to be in care because of the pressure cooker of family life and the likelihood of increased violence and neglect. And also carers that are currently looking for children might not be able to look after them because of the virus. Uh, so, you know, I've met incredibly generous people that have given money to Home for Good so that they could live not as well off as their, their, their bank balance would kind of tell you, but at a level that actually will keep them, their, their hearts pure and close to God. And they've tried to give their money away in a way that will do good. And so they've supported us. This is not a financial ask, although if you do want to support Home for Good, now would be a great time. But here's, here's the book of Proverbs telling you, too much might be bad for you. And God is saying to the people of Israel, that might be true for you. Once you're not in the desert anymore, will you still hold on to me? And there are two things that we're told to do. The first is to give thanks. He says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Praise God for what he has given you. Recognise that your wealth and your uh, busyness and your job and your security, those are gifts from God. Praise God for it. Say thank you to God. That will keep your heart sensitive to God and aligned with him. And so a thankfulness that you might start now, even thanking God for the little things. Our, our families homeschooling as many people are and we're using uh, our window sills as hydroponics labs we're growing little uh, carrot tops and watching them sprout and there's so much fun watching my um, foster children they're, they're younger uh, just take great delight in the shoots coming up there's, there's wonder going on there and I just want them to say thank you God thank you for this little miracle of life and growth I want to teach them a thankfulness I want to develop that in my life and if you if you practice thankfulness if you have an attitude of gratitude now that will be a pattern of your life that will carry on 
when life gets better. And the second thing they're told is do not forget. Do not forget. Remember. Remind yourself. And I think maybe these little videos might, might be a help, uh, a way that you remember the big story. You can see the big picture. You're not just this caterpillar growing up uh, at the IMAX screen. You can see the big picture of what God's doing. And you remember that God is in charge and you will not forget him because you're going to continually remind yourself. I'd love to know what you are making of these videos and um, you know, g give me a, a, a give me some feedback. Uh, why don't you drop me a message? Tell me who you are and what you're watching. Um, a friend of mine had an idea that if you're someone who is a church leader in any form of church leadership, you might want to leave a smiley face uh, to let me know that you're watching. Uh, or if you're a um, maybe you're a charity leader like me. Uh, you might want to leave, um, I don't know, a face with the hearts on. I don't know what that is called, but a face with the hearts on. And um, and if you're just someone exploring the Christian faith and uh, you're not quite sure uh, whether you believe this stuff or not, you're just kind of having a look. You're like shopping in the shop window. Uh, you might just want to leave me a thumbs up just so I know who's out there and uh, how they're getting on. And we'll be looking at various issues as we go through our time together. There'll be another one of these uh, tomorrow at 8 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. And uh, if you've got a topic or a question or you want to dig into this a bit more, I would love to hear from you because uh, this will help me know that I'm being useful to you. Uh, I've got to give a shout out to my sister whose home group is watching this uh, tonight uh, so that they don't have to prepare a little study for themselves. Home groups, if you want to use that, that's totally fine. You go for it. Uh, but let me know how you get on. I'd love to stay in touch. Drop me a line soon. All right. See you tomorrow.